Well, I wouldn't water. jump off a bridge. <laughs> you can stand up in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And our mission? Our mission is to prepare and support all students within a culture of excellence to do their best and to be their best, so that each can be a successful contributing citizen, able to adapt to change and to successfully respond to the future. I'd like to start this evening's meeting with a moment of silence for Gus LeBlanc, who was our PRHS football coach and our interim PRHS dean of students. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. And I'll start tonight with public comment. I forgot to bring my public comment statement, so <laughs> I will just say welcome. Um, and um, just a reminder that um, we don't respond to you, we won't respond to questions tonight, but we will certainly, if you have questions, um, get back to you or um, address it later in the meeting if it's on the agenda. So we have some people that have signed up for public comment and Kim Grant. And for those of you who don't know Kim, Kim is not new to this district. Maybe you want to tell us a little bit how you know us. So it's so fun to see so many familiar faces here. This is wonderful. So I actually was the assistant superintendent in the district for just two short years, uh, which I stayed longer, but you know that's easy to say now. Um, <laughs> but it was absolutely wonderful. I enjoyed my time here very, very much. And tonight I'm here with Shannon, and we're on behalf of Rank Ponds Association, which is a nonprofit looking after the water quality in our three ponds. So, anything else, Mary? No, no, okay, okay, okay great. All right, so welcome. I'm Kim Grant, and thank you. And I'm Shannon Dwyer from 21 Lakeshore Drive residence. So, um, thank you for this time. We just want to let make the community aware of um, um, Rank Pond, which is a nonprofit dedicated to protecting lower, middle, and upper rank. And we are looking for just to raise awareness about something that's coming up which is along with the main Department of Environmental Protection in the Androscoggin Valley Soil and Water Conservation District. I have to read that again. <laughs> That's a lot of words. Um, we will be conducting a watershed survey um, on the ponds on May 11th, 2024. And the survey is necessary to protect the water quality of our ponds from threats against um, things such as the algae bloom, which many of you know we have in September of 22. And a watershed survey has not been done in the last 20 years. And I, we think it's really important for people to know that the watershed survey will not involve code enforcement nor legal compliance at any level. The only function of the survey is to identify non-point sources of runoff that's carrying phosphorus and other nutrients into the lakes, which are negatively impacting their health. And the algae bloom that Shannon just talked about, that is a, a prime example of what we have to worry about. Mm -hmm. So by identifying specific areas of concern, we can then seek funding, such as from the federal um, 319 grant, section 319 grant, to help mitigate or remediate the issues that we identify through the, through the survey itself. Uh, the, anything that's done to mitigate or remediate is also going to be done through cooperation and a totally voluntary basis. And I'm going to say that again because that is really important. Hi, Joe. <laughs> that's a very important part. Uh, it is completely voluntary. All of this is completely voluntary. People with property in the watershed will receive a postcard allowing them to opt out from the survey if they choose. But we are asking everyone to please instead participate because only by getting to do this survey are we going to be able to identify areas that are a concern, that are dangerous to the lake and the future um, of its health. So without the survey and the requested access, we cannot fix these problems and we know they exist and we know that they're only going to get worse if we don't address them. So our goal is to protect the water quality of our ponds for the wildlife and for those who recreate in them. And I know how popular, we all know how popular those ponds are uh, during the summertime. Boaters and kayakers, people fishing in the winter when we finally have ice in, <laughs> and uh, swimming. So we want to keep those legs healthy. So we 
<laughs> Point of privilege, I'll let her finish. <laughs> okay. Good. 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 Six minutes. All right, I like it. Okay. Um, I'll make it fast. So there's going to be a public meeting uh, to provide more detailed information and answer any questions about this worship survey. That's going to happen on Saturday, April 6th, 1130 to 1. And that's going to happen at the Poland Town Hall, located 1231 Main Street, right here in Poland. Uh, we understand that board members will not be asking questions tonight. Um, Mary, I was wondering if I could leave the association's email address with you in case anybody has any sure. questions they'd like to. Uh, we'd also like to take the opportunity to thank you for allowing us to talk about the May 11th survey and the April 6th informational meeting. And then finally, we especially thank you for all of your service to students in our districts. And our thank you both for sharing thank you. the information. That meeting was April what? Six, April six. six. Yes, eleven thirty. Where? It's going to be at the Poland Town, Town Hall. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, Mary Ann. So um, I just had a couple questions about um, the budget process, in particular the A track. Um, bonds uh, that we're discussing as well as budgets for renovations to to fix the schools and renovate them. The amount that was proposed in the last board meeting, that was just for the HVAC system. That amount didn't include renovations. Is that correct? Um, and that was just interest. It is but a part of our agenda to talk about that um, later on in, in the agenda and and also, Todd's going to be at your, your next um, select person's meeting. So. Okay. And we'll have lots of questions about that. I just wanted to raise some concerns. So just um, being, I'm, by the way, I'm on the select board for Poland, but obviously I'm also a resident, and um, I have children that come here. So, um, you know, obviously this is a huge uh, major interest to me and the community members that I represent as well. Um, it just, my concern is that this seems a little bit more of much of the same. Um, my concerns would be getting the, the community's buy-in um, and the bond, which was more than $2 million less, was rejected. Um, so I think people are going to want to see, you know, how are we going to, you know, what are you doing strategically to uh, address the issues with the schools? Not much of the same. Um, it seemed like some of the recommendation was to continue with only putting in 200000 into the SIP. Again, that was something that I know was raised by quite a few members. That obviously isn't enough to maintain and um, properly repair some of the issues with the schools. Um, so I'd like to hopefully hear more of what you plan to do about that. Um, you know, one year's interest payment it could double the SIP budget, as an example. Um, so I just hope that we hear a lot more about that. And again, if this was, you know, if this was our home budgets or, you know, a business, um, you have to prioritize. If there isn't enough money to do all the things that you want to do, it makes sense to, to prioritize. So I just wanted to throw that, that out there. I'm sure there's more to come. And I look forward to kind of hearing more and working with you and hopefully um, providing some ideas and supporting you guys on that. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. I appreciate you being at our meetings. Oh, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, moving on to recognitions and acknowledgments. And if you'll uh, see, we have a long list of those, uh, a lot to celebrate. Um, so we will get going. Uh, congratulations to January's Optimist Student of the Month, Abigail Dertzik, uh, grade six at Elm, Elm Street School. Congratulations to February's Optimist Student of the Month, Jonathan Cram from, from uh, ERHS. And then the Tritown Optimist Club held their annual oratorical contest on February 13th. The topic was how to change the world with optimism. First place was Elise Helslip. Uh, she went in second place with Ava Carrier and third place was Henry Newton. Congratulations to Audrey Frida, uh, Cheyenne Toth, uh, Brandy Milton, and Braden Stickney, uh, Robert Fuller, and David Trump, who qualified for the speech and debate nationals in Chicago in May. 
congratulations to uh, Ariana Brooks, um, and Elm Street, Avery Barnett, and Brendan Onion for our recognition in the student writing contest. A big congratulations to our class of 24 valedictorian, Audrey Trida, and our salutatorian, our own. Whittier History Day students uh, were recognized and had the opportunity to participate in the Maine National History Day on April 27th at the University of Maine, Orono. And we would like to recognize those students for their first, second, third, and honorable mentions in each category. Individual websites, Ella Jacobs, Alicia Starbird, Ethan Sewell, an honorable mention, Vivian Cologne and Grayson Noyes. Uh, under group websites, Carly Jarvis, Bella Pelletier, Eli Camodi, uh, Elliot Cologne, Eddie Johnson, and Jackson Luce. Uh, papers, that's Isabella Lazat, Bella Hartman, Caitlin Harlow, Peyton Campbell, under documentaries, Madison Abbasi, Emily uh, Bustamant, and Wyatt Scribner, under individual exhibits, Alicia Mason, uh, Husky Langerton, Sophie Susa, Alan Martin, Scarlett Quince from Columbia, uh, Haley Karen, and Anna Wilson. And under group exhibits, Aria Zerbia Yerksa. That's my sister. Avria Yerksa. Uh, say it again. Avria. Avria. Pretty name. Mm -hmm. And Annabelle Smith, uh, Lillian McAllister. Lilla Martin, uh, Megan Kamenski, uh, Ava Petnitis, uh, Catalina Andres, Andrades, Andrades, okay, Grayson Kimball, and Emily Stamford, and Baylin Coon. And then under our LRTC Skills USA winners, there were three categories gold, silver, and bronze. Under gold was uh, Oliver Olson, Thomas Hamilton, Zaya Sewell, Reagan Cohen, Joshua Cloutier, uh, Aslan Blake, Elise Gagnon, under silver, Cameron Lemieux, Reagan Cohen, uh, Cameron Tufts, Joshua Cloutier, Rudy Killinen, Donnie Bursek, Hope Lamont, Elise Gagnon, uh, Aiden uh, Bailey, Olivia Rio, Nicole Rio, Isaiah Sewell, and Olivia Rio. And also, congratulations to our PRHS girls basketball who wrapped up an incredible season with a playoff game at the Augusta Civic Center, finishing 13 7. An indoor track, um, I'd like to say congratulations to Cohen Devon, uh, Mason Dolworth, Caden Langlois, and Ethan Witten. Under swim, Cayman Lemieux, and under alpine ski, Dylan Cobb. And we'd also like to say thank you to our music educators, because it is music in our schools month. So lots to celebrate. Yeah. Um, under presentations, let's start with a presentation on the senior class trip. So we'll take action on that following presentation. Derek. Cool. Uh, my name is Derek Latham. I am an English teacher here at the high school and also wear the hat of class advisor to the class of 2024. Um, I have planned three such trips uh, to different areas, but the last one that we would have had in 2020 was canceled, so it's been eight years since we've done a class trip under my watch. Um, we are planning to go to Adventure Bound um, Youth Adventures in Caratunk, Maine. Um, this is a whitewater rafting facility and, and sort of adventure type of a facility that has all kinds of different options for kids. Uh, we depart Sunday, May 26th, um, generally midday, although I still have some work to do with the folks there uh, to depend on when they want us to arrive. And then we return on Monday, May 27th in the evening. Uh, we've got an itinerary uh, where we arrive mid-afternoon. Uh, there's typically an on-site orientation where we get things squared away with um, where kids are going to be staying in cabins, rules of the roost, and all that sort of thing. And then they have a ton of games and activities for us to play on site um, at the facility. They then uh, put on a dinner and a bonfire for us. Um, and then there's some after dinner activities that kids can um, enjoy before we do lights out. On Monday, we will be eating an early breakfast. Uh, we break into groups um, where we're 
primarily there to, to be rafting, but we also recognize that there are some kids that are a little bit um, afraid of getting in those um, crafts and, and going through the rapids. And so we've got a couple of uh, hiking options, one a guided hike, uh, another an unguided hike, obviously, that would be chaperoned. Um, and then uh, we also offer for kids that would like to go and experience the river, uh, but not do the rafting, they get to go down with some of the advanced scouts who often take pictures at um, some of the bigger rapids uh, and then bring those back so that we can have a video um, sort of wrap up at the end of the day. Uh, they cook a shore lunch for us on site. Um, other kids will be given um, bag lunches if they do the hikes. Uh, and then we wrap up the activities and head back to the lodge where they usually will show a video and give kids an opportunity to buy a DVD. I'm sure actually the last time I went it was a DVD. Now it's probably going to be a link. Uh, um, the cost um, is going to depend on how many kids uh, go. Right now we have put out a survey. Um, as you might imagine, sometimes kids are not as quick on the effort to fill out the survey. But we've got about 60 kids that have responded. 42 have indicated that they're absolutely going to go. Uh, another 10 are sort of trying to figure things out, whether or not it's going to work with their schedule. Um, and then eight or so have said, nope, I'm not going to make it. Um, and we've got six to 10 chaperones. They ask for us to have a chaperone per 10 kids. Uh, right now we have six. Um, I always open it up first to the roundtable advisors of the graduating class. So we've got an administrator, Kat Meter will be going uh, along with myself um, and five other teachers. And then if we need to, if we, if we find that our numbers are large enough, we're gonna open it up to the general population of teachers um, to get other um, chaperones as well. Uh, we'll be using RSU 16 buses for transportation. Um, as far as the cost, um, seven to 9,000 um, in terms of the trip itself, the lodging and all of those things. And then we are estimating based on last year, although fingers crossed, I know fuel costs were a little bit more last year. So 2,000 was the number last year based on, um, I think they called it deadheading where they had two buses go up, one bus go down with both bus drivers and then they came back the same way to pick us up the next day. Um, so uh, costs are still sort of being worked out um, and we are actually doing one last fundraiser to try to sort of um, ease any additional costs that we might find with regard to other things that we have to pay for at the end of the year this year. Um, so um, I can take questions if there are any. Um, I think that this is sort of just sort of subject to board approval at this point. Any questions? Dr. So, just going off past experience, I don't know. Um, seems 50 to 75 is a pretty low number. Um, is it normally that low? Yeah. How do we, this my cadence and trauma, how do we get like more excitement out of a class mm -hmm. trip? Because like that should be something like every senior should want to go on. You know what I mean? I agree. Part of the thing is that we just couldn't, like nobody's going to be happy with whatever you picked. Every time we would say something, everyone would just disagree. But then nobody could come up with a better option that everybody would like. So that made it difficult. So this was kind of something that we got a lot of people to agree on. And there's still a lot of people that did it. We're just like, I'm not going to be happy no matter what we choose. So is there, sorry, follow up. Is there any out of pocket cost to the students or just like? We typically, depending on where the budget stands, um, are able to charge $20 per kid that's going to go. And I would say based on where the budget stands right now. And I will say, um, this class in particular, which is why I may end up appealing to the general fund to some extent, but um, they came in as ninth graders during the COVID hybrid year, which uh, I've talked to a few administrators and other teachers, which I uh, term a fundraising vacuum, right? Two days a week we were seeing kids, they were in masks. I didn't even really know other than in some Zoom meetings, my own um, class officers. So um, that was sort of a throwaway year in terms of fundraising. So we've been catch playing catch up ever since. Um, so we will definitely be, I would say, asking for the twenty dollars per kid that is the out-of-pocket cost, but still for like a wrapping trip, that's a big reduce. Pretty good deal. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Any other <clears throat> comments or questions? Seeing none. All those in favor? Opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Watch out for the polar bears. <laughs> and, uh, Mr. Holly, do you have somebody that to introduce tonight for our second cousin? Uh, I can introduce him if you'd like me to, but this is really his project. Okay. He's a senior brain sticky, and yeah. he has a proposal that he'd like to float to this school board. Okay. 
I am a senior here at PRHS, and I have come to you with a concern I have for the school. To get us started, let me first introduce you to the school parking lot. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with it. This parking area holds a section for the students, yeah. <laughs> the staff, and a bus load. Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Every day, large amounts of cars from both parking lots leave this <clears throat> um, leave this property along with all the other buses. Not only are there student and staff vehicles, but there are also parents of students of the middle and high school leaving as well. Based off of my personal experience, this whole process can take around 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how bad the traffic is. Usually this wouldn't call con for concern. But there's an issue that arises when something is causing traffic to build up on Route 26. This issue stems from the design of the parking lot here at the school. The issue is that there is only one way in and one way out. This may not seem like a big issue, but you have to realize that if something is to go wrong on Route 26, like an accident of some kind, the people of PRHA in the PRHS parking lot could be stuck here for hours leaving the only, the only alternative being driving across the football, the soccer field, excuse me, and ruining, potentially ruining the fields. <clears throat> Last fall, Route 11 was finally getting repaved near the intersection. Students, staff, parents, and buses turning left towards the intersection took a very long time to leave. And this wasn't even right in front of the school. Had there been an emergency in, um, in front of that exit, there wouldn't be anybody leaving. This kind of parking lot set, set up stirs panic among the other drivers in an emergency. Think back to the intense rain and windstorms that we had back in December. The week where rain got into local homes and businesses, leaving some people stranded and others devastated. When we left school early that day for intense wind and potential flooding, the school parking lot was manic. The waiting caused people to be frantic, so much so that one individual cut me off near the exit. <clears throat> Is this the <laughs> yes, that is, that is the actual car that got me out. This car narrowly missed my vehicle. They blared their horn at me, but I knew that I couldn't exactly blame them. I knew they wanted to leave just as urgently as I did. Everyone needed to leave quickly to ensure that their path home wasn't blocked by a fallen tree or flooding that had worsened throughout the week. Clearly, there is an issue with the amount of time that it takes to leave the parking lot. So how would we end up fixing this issue? The way I see this issue getting resolved is via a new exit. A new exit would rapidly decrease the amount of time it would take for the cars and buses to leave. The next problem comes in figuring out where to set this exit up. I have laid out three possible solutions on Google Earth, and I'd like to take you through some of these options. All of my estimations come from the help of Brandon Dagno, one of the gentlemen at Dagno Landscape LLC, a local landscaping company in the county of Androscoggin. The first option that I have named path one is the route that starts right before the exit of the student parking lot. <clears throat> this path would be roughly 1,175 feet in length, and depending on whether we would make that a one lane or two lane road, the price would vary. A one lane exit would cost in the neighborhood of about $141,000. If we were to make this two lane, it would be even more at about $235,000. The advantages of this route is that we already have an exit out there by the parking lot for the ball fields. The difficulties that would come with this route is that <clears throat> uh, it is one of the longer routes that I've created, which makes it expensive and, and makes it harder to build regardless of whether there are two, one lane or two lane. Secondly, there is a pond along this route that would be difficult to avoid or pave over in general. It's located right about, yeah, right about where JRs get that pointer, which would definitely add to the costs of this path. 
Now, my second, my second idea is for a route that goes through the woods next to the bus loop. It's the area, it's the line that is pointed out with the uh, red arrows. <clears throat> Advantages to this path are that it wouldn't require that we go over a pond. However, this would require that we deforest this entire route, which would add a lot of time to complete this project and cost more in the end. To even complete this route, we would need a right of way easement. In this picture, you can see that our property doesn't quite reach Trip Lake Road. Our property, our property is um, lot six. And it's cut off by 6A, which is owned by the town of Poland, and lot five, which is owned by STJ Real Estate LLC. Since lot A, 6A is the town of Poland, we wouldn't need to worry about getting an easement there. But lot five is where we would need to negotiate with the owners. If all goes well, we can build the rest of the road through this property. One of the greatest disadvantages of this path is the cost of building. As I mentioned before, we would need to deforest this entire section of land. Due to this path's length, we could easily be looking at a cost of $147,360 to $245,600. Looking at my last exit plan, we have path three. Path three has a similar situation to path two. This path crosses over the same property lines as path, as path two, requiring that we still get that easement from the property owners. Path three is the shortest and least costly of all three of these paths. Most of the path runs along flat ground around the baseball and soccer fields. This path could cost anywhere from $127,200 to $212,000. Compared to the other paths, this egress route would only require that some trees be cut down. But for the most part, the path is essentially set up for us. Now, ideally, we could start making a lane, an exit for, via path three. One lane would be the best since we don't really need another entrance, really just an exit in the case of an emergency. <clears throat> But I realize that this won't be easy. Trust me, I realize that $200,000 doesn't just fall out of the sky. <clears throat> it's nearly a quarter million dollar project. I'm here to say that I'm here. I'm just here to say that for the interest of the safety of the teachers, the custodians, the parents, and my fellow students, we need to start allocating money towards this project. It would be better to be safe and have a backup exit than to be sorry and strand 500 plus students and staff in this parking lot. Thank you. Are there any questions? Great job, buddy. We talked about this when the place first opened up. Yes. So, does anybody have any, any questions? Mm. You did a, a nice job, and, and generally um, proposals kind of go through proposals like this through our operations committee. Um, so that might be, I would guess, the next place that we might want to have some follow-up discussion in terms of uh, next steps and whether there's um, anything that you feel like we can do for to address this problem. You did a nice job describing it mm -hmm. and you gave it some alternatives to look at. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I have a question, but it's it's for us. Is there a reason why there's only one entrance? Is that a security thing um, or something like that? Or John, do you want to address <coughs> Andrea's question? She wonders why we have just one. Well, it had to do with the planning 30 years ago. Um, and my guess is it was probably come down to cost. Thanks, John. Any other questions or comments? No. All right. Job. Moving on to our special education director. <clears throat> Yep. Um, good evening. I'm Joe St. Peter. My slideshow. Did you I emailed it to you. Just give me one second. Yeah. And handouts of the slideshow are going around. 
And while they're doing that, I will just introduce Ben Drake, who is sitting next to JR. Well, JR, unfortunately, isn't going to be with us forever. So, Yay, he's 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 training ben. so thank you for doing that, JR. And Ben, thank you for being here. Welcome. <laughs> All right. So you guys know who I am. So our next slide. Talked a lot this year in my board reports about an edtech shortage, and I'm happy to report that over the year we have hired ten edtechs. Wow. I know, I know, I was surprised when I pulled the numbers. So four of them are at Elm Street School, two are at PCS, one for the middle school, and three at the high school. So I, just great news so for our kids. Next slide. Um, I just wanted you guys to know what our uh, percentages of identified students were for the district. So we're at about 17%. Um, July last year, 2023, is the last the state put out their average, which was 20.1%. You go to our next slide, you'll see our identification percentage by school. Um, so you'll notice it says district programs. So like at Elm Street, they have a program there that's K to six. So that's a self-contained program. So that can increase your numbers, but there are schools based on their percentage of identified kids. So Elm Street's at 24%, uh, Mina and PCS are 15%, the middle school is 17% and the high school is 11% right now. That does not include our kids that are outplaced. I pulled them out just so you could see who is in our buildings right now. If you go to our next slide, so you'll see that these are our outplaced students. They go to special perfect private school, so that's a decision that their IEP team makes. Right now we have a total of 17 students who are outplaced. Nine are in K to six programs, six are in seven to eighth grade programs. And for our nine through 12 plus, those are kids who go beyond 18. We have two students outplaced right now at that grade level. Go to my next slide. This is just where our numbers are at this year. Each year we try to bring outplay students back into the district if it's appropriate. So we're very happy to transition in back an eighth grader and a ninth grader. But then we transferred in two students into the district who were already outplaced. So we have to honor those placements and they were in third grade and tenth grade. Um, we have outplaced on our own one student and they were on a wait list from the previous school year. So they did get a placement. So that's why we're at 17 right now. And last slide, good news, our Unified Basketball team had a great season. They went three and three, so very proud of them and the coaches and everyone that worked with them. And then our next slide gives you an update on our Special Olympics. So we were at the Winter Games, where they were at Lost Valley for February 29th. They had 14 participants, K through 12 plus. Um, our upcoming Special Olympics, we have a swim for level one on March 11th, and then on the 18th is level two at the Lewiston Y. And then our spring games will be at Edward Little. They haven't announced the uh, date yet for that. And then the state summer games are June 7th. And that is what I brought you guys for information. Just a quick update of where we're at in special services. Oh, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, Joe, we got some questions. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, how do you think the uh, state's new legislation on ed techs is going to affect our program moving forward? And just in case you don't know, uh, they passed uh, increasing ed tech salary to be, I think it's like $22. Yeah, that'll have a, an impact on my budget, the budget that we have. I will say we need the ed techs that we have in, our, in place right now. So that's something Todd and I will probably look at when we go over my budget. Yeah. It'll have it'll have an increase in salaries for sure. Joe, I wonder if you might want to talk a little bit about maybe the challenges that might be coming up in terms of child development services. Sure. So CDS is looking to the state uh, department that has asked them to merge the three and four year old preschool kids into our schools. Um, at first, they were supposed to be here by 2028, but now they put that off until 2029. So. In terms of what that looks like, there are a lot of unknown answers to questions like, are your facilities large enough? Are your playgrounds for three-year-olds? Are your staff certified for three and four-year-olds in special education? Um, so the answer is, if it truly happens, and I think it will, there'll be an impact. Um, but I'm not sure what that will look like in terms of how much staff we have or things like that. I don't have a projection of who our three-year-olds will be in 2029 um so 
Yeah, I anticipate that it'll have an impact on us. We have pre-K now in our schools. Some students are identified there through CDS. Um, so, you know, it seems it'll be manageable. We have to do what's best for the kids, so we'll do what we need to do. My biggest concern is that CDS will still have some control over those IEP meetings, so those students might be outplaced at like a special purpose private school, and we'll have to assume that cost. So that's my biggest concern, mm -hmm. is students that might be outplaced and how do we get them back in? Any other questions for Joe? Thank you. Thank you guys, have a great night. Thank you. Our consent agenda is next. And within our consent agenda is to approve the meeting minutes of our regular meeting on February 12th. Um, we have some new staff, uh, sports staff hires. Uh, Rhonda was here, um, softball coach at the middle school. Chelsea Davis, uh, JV softball at high school. We have some notifications of resignations. Bronson Stanett, uh, gifted and talented teacher at Elm Street and Lina. Darby Stanett, a Spanish teacher here at the high school. Sophia Stone, fourth grade teacher. Jenny Rose, a uh. education director. Uh, and Lori Richardson, uh, bus monitor for the district. Uh, included are our subcommittee minutes and our friends of our T16 minutes. I make that motion to accept. Second it. Motion and second. Any questions? Yes. Angela? Uh, Jess and I both are missing from members present for personnel and finance and also educational policy committee. Okay. We will make those corrections. So, um, Steve and Mike, uh, you want to change your to with those corrections? Total. Approval with those corrections. Anything else? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? And Stacy, um, acceptance of our financial summary, which was included and is recommended by the personnel and finance subcommittee at the February meeting. Do you want to talk a little bit about that first? Yeah, we, yeah I will. We, we, we talked about bringing more information to this meeting. And so I do want to make everyone aware that, as you know, we were approved for the revolving renovation fund. I'm trying to speak loud so people can all hear me. We do have to go to referendum for that, even though we were already approved. So there'll be a warrant to sign at your April board meeting to call that referendum. It is five years, 0% interest. And so our portion that we'll have to pay back each year is $8,378. You'll see that first amount in this upcoming budget for FY25. Um, the referendum, the warrant does have to be signed five to six weeks before the referendum vote. So that's why we're bringing it to you in the April meeting because the May meeting would not give us enough time. We will have to have a hearing and we can have, we are allowed to have that the same night as our district budget meeting so we don't have an additional meeting but it would just have to be separate. So we, we might start that at 6 to 6.30 and then start our district budget meeting at 6.30. Um, but we will have to have a hearing on that um, because it will be voted on at the election in June. We talked about bonding and leasing. Um, I included two amortization schedules in your packets that you got this month. One shows a bond estimate that is on the three projects that we are looking at. As you can see, that is a variable interest rate over the life of the bond. And that would be with the bond bank. That means interest can change from year to year? It does change from year to year. It's right on the schedule. Yeah. Okay. I looked at it. The other is the lease purchase that we did with Siemens. We completed that in 2021. That is a fixed rate for the life of the project and interest rates below then that is 2.46. We discussed whether we had to take all the money in that lease purchase and we did. So when the project was done, 
we still had $2,198 that we had not used. We did have to, to accept that, and it, it was part of the, the payback. Uh, and then we talked to a vendor of ours and got some information on a master lease purchase agreement, which I will talk about that in just a minute. Um, when we were building the middle school, there was a bond. We took control of the money, and we were able to generate over $30,000 worth of interest that we were able to use for the project. Um, interest rates were much lower then, and that project was $5.7 million. Uh, the current investments we have right now are earning 5.15 and 4.6. The master lease purchase is an additional um, vehicle for you to consider for going forward with the projects. It is for energy projects only, which is what this will be. It is a fixed rate for the life of the loan. You request an amount, so I'm just going to use $7 million as an example. And then your first project, if it's $2.5 million in my example, you would look at what the index for the current interest rates are at that point in time. And again, that would be fixed over the life of the repayment. The funds would be deposited into an interest bearing escrow account with the bank. So we would earn interest as, as the money was sitting there and we hadn't used it. Invoices would be sent to the bank and they would pay them. So it would not affect our cash flow for our general fund or, or CIP or any of the stuff we would be working on. When it came time for your second project, let's say that's 4.5. Can you slow million. down a little, please? Thank you. Sorry. I can, I can give it's you okay. all this in writing. Okay, great. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm like, Todd has a copy, so we okay. can actually hear discussions. Thank you. Yep, Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, the second project, let's say that's 4.5 million. Uh, you, you do that a year later. Again, the bank looks at what the index rates are at that point in time, and then that 4.5 million is over the life of that payback is a different interest rate. You know, could be lower, could be higher, could be the same thing, but it's whatever the current interest rate is at that point. Um, so you'd have you'd have two separate projects. They, they may have separate interest rates. So now let's assume you go to do the second project and you only need 4 million. You don't need 4.5. You do not have to take the 4.5. Even though you originally asked for $7 million, if you don't need that much, you don't have to take that much. And so there would be savings there on interest. We, we only have to pay back what we commit to um, for the projects. Say the project's 4.6 million. So now that's more money than we originally said we needed. What would happen at that point is the bank would want to do a credit approval again. So just go through that process again, and then you could, could take the extra money. Um, what that means for voting, you know, that's, that's a lawyer question, but um, it is an option for you to have in a master lease purchase agreement, which is different from a lease purchase agreement. Um, it's a... 30 to 45 day closing window. So from the point in time where we have a meeting, we'd be meeting with the bank, the bank's attorney, our district's attorney, superintendent, finance person, anyone else the superintendent wanted there. Um, you, you would have the meeting, there'd be a proposal and a term sheet for your first project, and then it'd be 30 to 45 days to close on that. And then your funds would be available to start paying your contractors as the work would begin. Uh, unlike the bond, this is the, the only similar piece to this and a regular lease purchase agreement is that there is a prepayment penalty. It's a 2% premium. Tell me what that means again. If you prepay it, okay, I unlike the bond at the bond bank, the, the interest is running. So if you, if you pay it, you know, you've always got your principal. The interest is kind of going forward like your mortgage on your home. If you prepay it with the bond bank, there's no um, penalty with the lease purchase and the master lease purchases there are and it's a two percent premium two percent of what you prepay yes so if you're prepaying the whole thing off which i couldn't see us doing that you have to raise that money so i, I don't even see that happening but you have you know full disclosure if you decide for some reason you know Somebody wins the lottery and donates it all to the school and you want to pay it off. I lay down one I dream. <laughs> there is a prepayment penalty on, on the master. Stacey, what if you took out more than you needed for the project? 
So it probably wouldn't happen because where it goes into an interest-bearing account, um, you, you really wouldn't get more than your bid. So, so I think you'd know, you know, when you go to do your second project, you know, it's the 4 million, not the 4.5 or whatever. Um, because it goes in an interest bearing account and we then send the invoices in to pay it, you know, they, they hold on to the money. There's a reconciliation process. Mm -hmm. So if you don't need it all, you know, they wouldn't they'd take it back, but, you know, but we would earn interest and, you know, that would also be credited to the project. So, you know, if this is a multi-year project, depending on the interest rate, you know, you could have some there, you know, like, like I said, the, this, the middle school edition, we earned over $30,000 in interest. So, you know, and that was only from fiscal year 19 to 21. So it wasn't even a full three year, you know, time frame when we earned $30,000 in interest. So there'd, there'd be some interest also, you know, that we would be available to use for the project. And when were you thinking about like we were, like we did this Laval Innovation Fund next year and we were awarded that, but so we didn't need the We had taken amount. out all this money yeah. and now like with the prepayment, I just and I might not be like following this all the way, but I'm just thinking like what if we had two million dollars and we were awarded a million dollars in funds? Are we then like prepaying if we like return that money? Or am I use it? Right. You know, because like when does the I guess like they're paying Great the invoices, question. so we're not taking the invoice, the money out to pay the invoice. But now we have two million dollars sitting in this project. You're going to talk to me. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, just a moment. And that's a great question because you're doing it in phases, and so as you start your second phase, and you know you've got your your invoices and your, your um, estimate, and it's a certain amount of money and that comes in. So that's a great question. I can. Put that back to the bank. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I'm not going to have that for you tonight to make a decision. Um, and just going back to the referendum, the bond bank is standing by waiting to hear from me tomorrow if the big project's going to be bonded. Because if it, if it is, I have to have a warrant for you for the April meeting also to sign. So no pressure. But <laughs> Can um, we take uh, out, can it come out in small amounts? You know, like, could we, instead of doing like a whole project, could we look at like what one contractor is charging for like the, the initial phase, like excavation or something, and take out $100,000, or the project one is $100,000, whatever, just as a number. Because we know that we're not going to have, like, as we're waiting on that revolving renovation money, like, we kind of... Are you talking the bond bank? Or are you I'm talking, talking about the mass release, release purchase. And that's what it would be. So you would, so you would basically, tell them a, a chunk of money. We think it's going to be seven million dollars. So a contractor comes in and says, "Okay, I need a hundred thousand dollars to do X, Y, Z. Here's my invoice for all my parts, labor, and I'm doing it. There's a hundred thousand dollars go to the bond bank. That hundred, that what I assume is that hundred thousand is going to be at that interest rate that's locked in, right? So, or is it that full chunk this of?" Is the bond bank. No, a master, the master lease. lease. Master. You mean the master lease? Because a master lease, you can go in with invoices and be like, hundred thousand dollars excavation labor, boom. Yes, right. you submit the invoices individually, but, but for a project, for a project that you have already right. given them like the the full total for oh, the two point five million right. out of the seven, like we mm -hmm. got approved for the seven or whatever, and then we're taking out the two point five. I'm saying instead of going like two point five, like whole mine at school project, mm. could we just go in and say, all right, the next six months. We know we're going to do excavation and we're going to do plumbing. Can we just take out 200, whatever, a million dollars and cover that and then like reassess where we're at, get like new numbers from like it just things change so quickly and we're moving slowly. It's a big project and it's a big system. So I have another example. Like right. We decide one. what, you know, I, I wouldn't do 200,000 because yes. now you've okay. got this yeah. 20 year payback. Yeah. And, yeah. But a million. <clears throat> yes. A million out of okay, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for 20 years. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then if we're still awarded, if we do get awarded the SRF, if there is SRF next year, um, we only pay 40%. That technically does have to go to bond, but we do have that money in the bank that we can move it around. And we're still going to, so basically we're going to pay off. We're still going to do a prepayment penalty of 2%. 
but we're still going to end up ahead. You know what I mean? We're paying 42% instead of 40%. You, know what I mean? you cannot take your revolving renovation fund and use it for a payment on a lease purchase. Okay, so. Because you, you don't get all the money, so. Right, yeah, it's still in the bank. It's two separate things. The revolving renovation fund has legal requirements that it has to go through because then it's to pay for the project and then we pay our portion back over, in this case, five years at zero percent interest. But you can't you can't take that money when you put an application in for say a roof. Mm -hmm. So when you get that money, you can't take it and apply it to as a principal payment or interest mm -hmm. payment or something else. You have to use it for what you have been awarded it for. So in our scenario, if we're in the rebate. we in the game of the RRF fund game that we played this year, or we applied to play, um, <laughs> we lost the game. Um, so in our scenario, in our timeline, we will be already moving yeah. forward with whatever we select tonight. The minor school is going to be scheduled. Things are going to be happening. So ideally next year, we'd not be applying for minor school funds. We would be applying for different projects that haven't been put through the lease process all the way. And keep in mind, this is only for energy projects. So if there's mm -hmm. something else, you know, if mine needs a roof, that couldn't come out of here. It couldn't come out of a master lease purchase. Mm -hmm. right. And we have to tell them up front how much total money we think we need for all of the years, or is it just that we say how much we need for the, the first project and then we come back and say? We tell them the full amount. And then when we're ready to do the first project, then we say, okay, we just need a million dollars for this first project. Um, so do you think it's more of an advantage for us to use a master lease or the regular bond? If you want my opinion, as your finance person. I, I do, person. because <laughs> you are the number cruncher. As your finance person, I've listened to some of your discussions and your concerns about having a $7 million bond and now we're paying all that interest on that money. I agree with you. I think this is more fiscally responsible. We're only getting what we need as we need it, when we need it. Um, and as you take up the chunks, you're going to earn interest on that money. It's going to be in an in a interest-bearing escrow account, so it's going to earn interest while the work's being done, while we're waiting for the bills to come in from the contractors. So um, I, I do think it's more reasonable, and I think it's more feasible, and I... Yes, mm -hmm. I would recommend doing the master lease purchase over long. Thank you. Yeah. Is there a drawdown period to the master purchase lease program? It's a 30 to 45 day closing. Okay. And then the money is put in whatever, you know, we say we want for the first project. But there's no time frame on the master purchase lease because, you know, God forbid, COVID happens and everything's shut down again, right? So we can't do a project one year because of that is it like that no, it's a multi-year whatever whatever it takes so us. It, it takes so we have that money infinitely in the bank as well forever. well keep in mind we don't have the money in the bank it's a commitment from the bank right that they're gonna you know they know we need seven million dollars with projects okay. so we don't until we need it for the individual you know they call it schedules so your first schedule is 2.5 million mm -hmm. that goes in that interest bearing escrow account mm -hmm. So, you know, two years later, we need another two million. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we're just not, it closes too early and we run out of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to nope. and so when Matt, when you're talking about we don't have to go to the voters and get approved, we go on our own. Oh, I'm not touching that one. <laughs> Todd. Yep. You can go with the master lease purchase, the board can make that decision. Without. But if you have a bond, it has to go to the wall. Correct. Wait. No, I don't believe that. And after talking to Stacy, and I will say, I think Stacy was on the bond side of the fence. I won't put words in her mouth, but I, I believe after our discussion, she was on the bond side of the fence. And after some very good conversations she had on Friday, she came back to me and said, you know, this is the way to go. I certainly have faith in her, and I would certainly support that. So we could be 15 heroes or 15 zeros. I wasn't sure if we were doing all our discussion now or like later on the agenda, but I just want to mention about the bonds. The concern that I had with that route is the time limits where she could only get the bond in May or November. And then we, you know, the construction schedule, right? None of these projects are going to be done except during the summer when the kids are not there. 
So we are really paying a lot of interest while we're holding the money and waiting. So that adds up very quickly with the amount of money we're talking about. So that was a, also a deterrent to the bond, in my opinion. Um, and then we have to build interest into the bond for the bond into this year's budget, which yes. we know is a tough budget. With the lease purchase, master lease purchase, we will not that money will not be in the budget for this year, correct? For that amount. I, I just have to have a few more discussions with John okay. about the timing of when it would okay. start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, just one more thing. We do have to put this out to bid. It was Bank of America that I spoke to. They've done a lot of lease purchases for schools, um, but we are required. If you decide to go this route, we do have to put it out to bid. Um, and there's other companies out there that can bid on it. But um, Bank of America is who I spoke to and got all the information uh, to bring to you tonight. Yeah. Do you mind if I say back in the summary what you said to us just to see if I've captured it? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so, mass, and I'm just going to focus on the mass release purchase program because that's your recommendation and it seems to make sense if I understand it correctly. So, we have a project. We have some discussions with the public of what is this project? Is it one school, two schools, three schools? So, you've thrown out an example of $7 million, which sounds strikingly like the total all in school reparations. Close in. So what the master lease purchase agreement gives to us is the, the ability to only tap into money in schedules. And then when we do that, let's say two million of the seven million, we put that in the bank. The invoices from contractors go directly to the bank for them to pay. We pay interest on that scheduled pull that's in the bank. We also earn interest on that money that's sitting in the bank. We only are committed to what the project is up to what we've asked for. So if we go back to that seven million, we're committed. We have, if we need more, we have to go back and do a reevaluation or whatever. The, yeah. Credit, just another credit right. check. If there was a miracle and those projects came in at five million dollars, that's all we have to spend. Correct. Okay. Is there anything that I missed? I don't think so. That okay. would be. Five-year-old version of understanding. <laughs> Very smart. Five Twelve. Twelve years. Well, Twelve years. Um, but I thought that's what you weren't positive about and needed to find out is that if <clears throat> if it comes back less than what we think or suggest to them that we anticipate it's going to be, if we are going to be penalized for that. You talking about the night of the subcommittee meeting? We no, talk I'm talking about like two seconds ago when Emily was asking about it. Like if if we tell them we think the projects are going to be ten million. That's what we may need. Turns out it's only eight. We weren't clear if we can still take the eight and not get in trouble for not taking the other two. That no, it's it's very clear that we only have to take what we need. I think she okay. was asking something about um, more per project. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So if if we splitting it up into hundred thousand dollar chunks, I wouldn't recommend that. Right. So we're a hundred percent certain that if it comes in less face value than what our contractors have estimated. Mm -hmm. okay then we're not going to be penalized for not touching the money at all. Right. The words okay. from the bank, we only commit to what we need. And she okay. specifically said, if you don't, if you only need $4 million, yeah. that's all you then have to take. We're okay. Yeah. Because okay. it's not, they're not giving us $7 million like the bond bank would. We right. would get $7 million. Yeah. Yeah. They're, 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 they're committing okay. to give us the money to fund our projects as they come through. Right. I understand that. Right. Yeah. It was the whole point of like, we're gonna tell them this big umbrella number, and then when hard numbers or live numbers come in and we don't reach that umbrella, if the gap in between is gonna penalize us. And mm -hmm. we're sure that's a no, yeah. that's a hard no. That is a hard okay. no. Okay. So I wanna ask a follow-up question to Angelis, because that was the last bit of what I was saying, <clears throat> you said million, miracles only five. Yeah. So I wonder, Stacey, if it would be uh, smart of us to say, we think this is a $10 million project, knowing that we don't have to spend that mm -hmm. and we don't have to go through it so we have plenty of room to cover this project because what we're saying is we want to take care of all of these schools only what they cost mm -hmm. so if it was 6.9 million great or 7.2 great and we're not using the other 2.8 million that we have possible do i have that right we have that right okay only hbac Right, because it's all, this is all, that's the other protection is that if somebody's listening out in the public, they're saying, oh, look at that guy, he's grabbing an extra $2 million, $3 million. 
No, because this, these funds can only be used for energy related projects. Mm -hmm. And we have so we researched all of the energy related projects. We don't want any more. Mm. Okay. Any other questions for Stacy? No, oh, sorry, Stacy. Um, Stacy, did you get any information from them on what the interest rate would be that we would pay and then what the interest rate is for escrow? She didn't have any interest rates because they don't do a rate sheet until there is a proposal. And that's once we've committed and have the meetings with the attorneys and stuff. So I would assume they'd be the prevailing interest rates because every time you do your schedule, which I'm going to call a project for us, they call them schedules. It is based on then, they look at the index for the current interest rate, and that's what it is. So, and right what's the difference right now between the interest rate on the bond bank and the current interest rate? Is so, the bond bank is a, is a current amortization schedule that I got for you. Um, when we were looking at all three projects with the bond bank, it starts at 3.1 in year one and runs out for 40 years at 4.289. Um, so it's it's all over the place. Uh, going back to the lease purchase we did in 2021, we closed on that in July of 2020, and rates were very low then. We got that project for 2.46. Rates, uh, regular rates well, I are. I don't know what regular rates are right now. I can tell you we're earning you know, five and four on our investments, which is really good. What's a mortgage? 6.8 or something? Yeah. Um, so I had a question. So, how does the bid process work then? So, if they can't really give us hard numbers or like, you know, interest escrow rates, then how does the bid process work? If you know, you said we got to put it out to bid. We got to get three bids. I know that's like standard and policy mm -hmm. for us, but how can they give us numbers? And if they're like, what am I missing with that? I would say at that point they would have to come up with a rate sheet to see what it is. Okay, we would have to have some numbers to right. decide on. And that brings me to my next question for our agenda item later: is why? Are, how are we voting on something that we don't have even those bid numbers back? Like, how does how does we that process work for us? Right. 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 If they come, all bid come in with a high interest, we don't have to accept them. Just delay us back another year. It would because yeah, it would be too late for the bond then. Yeah. But I can't imagine they're going to be much different than. Anything else. I think they're all going to be right yeah. within yeah. a half Absolutely. a point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Randy, a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, just for my own clarification, we're talking about uh, projects equals schedule. Is that is that what you're saying for for wording? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. All when right. I was talking to the bank, she was using schedule. So okay. you know, I said, okay, our first project. What if it's you know estimated at two point five million? And then she said, yep, that would be your schedule one. So it, what one of the um, we had talked about is if doing PCS and ESS at the same time. Is that would that be one project if we went it that way? Yes, that's how her and I spoke about okay. it. The, the second and schedule, second project. Before and I think I think I probably know the answer to this too. But it's like one of the things EMC had um, at least thrown out there was that like ESS could technically be done as like a phase in. So let's say whatever reason we decide hey, we have to do this as a phase in on ESS, is it a big deal that suddenly we're looking at potentially four schedules as opposed to three, or it could be you know. Five, I guess, if you did ESS, it's two. You understand what I'm asking? I don't know what, when you say phase in. I don't know. I'm sorry. So, like, we don't do all of ESS at once. Like, there's maybe, a, you know, a, a list of things that could be done that we could then go back later and, and finish off, and it wouldn't necessarily be a big deal. We'd still be able to sync it in with everything else we're doing. So what I'm wondering is if, for whatever reason, we say, you know what, we might have to actually do a phase in approach. How does that approach, uh, how does that affect this, uh, you know, everything you're saying here? Is it a... Um, you know, is it, it, it suddenly become four projects, or I guess that would be it, right? Or does does ESS get split into two projects in that scenario, or is it still considered one project, even though we're? I think I'm answering my question as I, I think go. That's over. kind of what they would talk. I think it, it is. It is. It is. Advantage, it seems like. I mean, unless the interest rates suddenly got really, really bad, mm -hmm. but that way we're not 
borrowing money that we're, we don't need for yet. another year till the next summer. Right. Mm -hmm. And Tom suggested that at the ops meeting that we, if we needed to, we could phase them out. Yeah. Specifically mentioned that with Elm Street that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that that could, that was a doable scenario. We just are then looking at like multiple repayment schedules, right? So like, yeah, there's like different five payments. Okay. And they might potentially all have five different interest rates in that scenario as well. Mm -hmm. okay. you know. Do you have any more questions for Stacy? Um, we will take action on that on your new business. Stacy, thank you for all your time. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. You wouldn't have a lot of it. You have to look at it. Stacy, we should approve the financial statement, though. We have make a motion to accept the financial statement. Second. 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 Motion, second. What was the motion? Accept the financial statement. Stacy's financial statement. Oh. There's a motion and a second to approve the financial statement. Any questions or comments? Um, all those in favor? Anyone opposed? Yeah. 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 Ye
I'm not throwing out any numbers to people yet because that's that's still in, in the works. Um, I am just uh, sharing that with them, the stage on which we are starting. Um, so they know that we are in a difficult position mm -hmm. and they've been very, very responsive. Um, the budget update kind of leading into that, uh, Stacy, Amy, and myself are meeting with principals and um, supervisors this week. We have three meetings today, we have three tomorrow, and we will do this throughout the week. When we conclude that, we'll review the, this, the, the notes that we have and the, the information we're able to get from our administrators and supervisors, and then we will craft what will become the initial, and I say initial, um, draft of the budget, because then as we move forward, that obviously goes to the budget committee for their um, feedback. Um, Subcommittee questions. There were some questions um, that were people kind of raised their heads a little bit about or, or after the uh, last meeting that we had uh, with the uh, with uh, EMC came and presented. Um, there was some concern about the um, numbers of 7.4 and the 10.2. We were talking about not to exceed. Um, I was assured that those numbers were accurate because there were some people who felt that maybe there wasn't all, there was some wavering or something like that. But I, I did get confirmation those numbers were accurate. Um, the uh, master's the master lease purchase agreement. I think Stacy did an awesome job answering all the questions that people have around that. So that was another one that we had um, that came up. Um, there was some question about contract. I'm not sure if this. I'll share this with this group. I'm not sure if this came up in one of my presentations or the subcommittee. But um, the contract is all within 30 minutes because we're concerned about local contractors. So they're all within 30 minutes. The ones that the bids received from. Um, let's see. Um, that's it. Any questions that we had? Uh, Tom Seekers did say that if anyone, you can certainly refer him. So if anyone has questions and, and you want to refer them to him, he said he's more than willing to talk with any individual who may have questions. Um, yeah, and then your enrollment numbers. Any questions for Todd or comments? So, first of all, I just want to thank you for going to the towns because I think that's important to like have that face to face with them um, and just even, uh, you know, an olive branch, so to speak, of transparency and being so I want to commend you for that. I'm, I'm glad we're doing that. Um, and I just want to verify that. So Tom said the numbers are accurate. Was it the same info that he gave us at the board, like within a 20 percent because of like inflation and costs and I, all that? I believe so. He said, okay. I said the numbers that we've been sharing with the board because John and I both say we can't yeah. go to go out with this number and then have it become this number, which right. I think is what happened last yeah. year. Yeah. Um, now, those numbers may change based on the information we have as far as the interest that 10.2 was was not to exceed. Yeah. And that was building in 2.4 or something in yeah. interest. So that number, hopefully, mm -hmm. based on what we've heard, if, if we, we go to the National Lease Burgess, would, yeah. would come down. Yeah. But by saying that not to exceed, you know, yeah. that would be our goal. Uh, okay. Our target. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Just in your conversations with the towns, have you started laying the groundwork to explain the additional referendum question? I think that's going to be confusing to voters of why we're accepting. You know how we have to accept the money for the 110,000 no from the idea. RRF because no. um, they're just going to see that extra question for this random amount of money and not understand what that why we have to do that. I don't want people voting no because that's no. still mostly free money that we're getting right. for something that needs to be prepared. When I know? went to the, the board, the select boards, I told them I will come to yeah. you initially mm -hmm. when just to set the, the, the groundwork for where we start. And I said, once I have numbers, which I would include that, uh, the more concrete for you as mm -hmm. we go through the process, I said, I will then come back and go through the numbers with you as well. Okay. So that would be the opportunity to share that. Okay. Okay. And any of you that want to join me. <laughs> I was gonna, but my husband had a meeting that night. I was oh, gonna be sure. at one. It was, it was good having yeah. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. questions or comments? Okay. Amy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I also have, was at Whittier National History Day. I didn't end up having to judge. Um, because there was need for, for projects for others, but uh, I do will say that. Uh, the history day started with one person in, in Whittier and has lived on, even though that person's gone, moved on. Uh, and I think that attests to the value of that project. And uh, I know all of the work that goes in with our staff uh, behind the scenes. So I just want to make sure to commend them as always. Uh, as Todd alluded to, Jenny and I were oratorical judges. Uh, Mary was the MC from the, from the um, 
the, the, the night, and it was a really tough contest. Lots of uh, big voices, and when I say big voices, it was really taking on some big uh, environmental pieces as well as uh, as well as talking about their personal stories and their own in sixth grade. So uh, it was very promising to see uh, their, their voices and their speeches. Um, we have a, a literacy grant through the DOE that we applied for. We worked together uh, with our, our administrators and we have received $91,000 from um, the DOE for literacy. And uh, I am super pumped that we are being able to offer a, uh, basically a kind of like a graduate level course, but it's not on the science of reading. Uh, I'm not sure how much you've seen that component out there of making sure that our teachers understand how to teach reading to our students. Uh, we have 30 staff signed up for that uh, across our, our K through K through five is really what the training is geared towards. So we are using a bulk of that $91,000 to train our staff and that will happen uh, starting in the next couple of weeks and run through September 30th and it's a very intense training. So I'm happy to uh, have 30 of our teachers be able to help lift literacy in our, in our district. We're also spending some of that money on a spelling program for grade four we are uh, and then also a uh, really great reading is an intervention program used at uh, PCS and Elm Street School and we've been able to extend that to Minot Consolidated School with their intervention program as well as at Whittier Middle School. We're also spending some of our money on training in Orton Gillingham for our special education department. Uh, Joe is smiling over there. It's been a training that they have been asking for and we're happy to be able to spend our money on that to be able to get our special ed teachers trained and the IEPs of their students. And then we are doing um, decodables, and decodables are simple books for our first and, sixth, uh, first and second graders that follow like a vowel pattern. So like pat the cat, like so it's all at that short A's. And so the students have practiced that, and then uh, they learn that, and they're able to practice that in books. So that's how we're going to spend the $91,000. So very excited about that. Uh, ecology school is coming up. We hosted the uh, webinar with our families, asked some really great questions. Uh, I appreciate the teachers being there, and uh, Jess Madsen was the administrator representing all three, and just being able to uh, talk with their, uh, they've had lots of commitment, and some of the teachers have been there for many years since the very beginning, and to put some, some uh, fears to the side that maybe some families and students have. And I'm super excited because all three of our schools are going to be able to be there at the same time. Mm -hmm. Typically, PCS goes for the or mm -hmm. you know once PCS goes for the half, first half of the week, and then Elm Street and mine go together at the second half of the week. But all of them get to be there at the same time, so I'm very excited about having low numbers because that allows us to be able to do, to do that part. Uh, we are gearing up for the eclipse that happens on April 8th. Uh, we're uh, sending out some resources to our teachers, even though knowing that the, the full eclipse doesn't happen until 328. But I do know that the teachers are working with uh, different groups to make sure that there are safety uh, knowledge out there of not to look at the eclipse, just like we should be looking at the sun on a daily basis. And I know some community groups are, are uh, purchasing glasses for the students. So uh, if, if any schools need those, they can always reach out to me and I will find some funds to be able to help with that event. I uh, did go to the UMF job fair. Uh, Todd was there, Joe was there, Brandy was there. We met uh, some of uh, the graduating uh, people from uh, potential teachers from UMF and uh, was hoping to rope them in with our charm. And we had this uh, amazing poster that you'll be able to see in uh, the conference room. We have, uh, we have 57 UMF alumni on staff. And so we have this huge poster with all of their pictures on it. And that was the talk of the job fair, people coming over to look at that and saying we're going to steal that the next year. And I saw their districts will be bringing a similar poster. So. Um, we also have a preventing homelessness grant that the DOE has um, put out, and we apply for that. And I am happy to say that we are we have supported three families. And uh, I also want to just say that that's through the trust and the work that our school counselors and social workers have with our families to be able for number one the families to say they need help to prevent homelessness, and then that, that's a big step right there. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, Fielding's Oil has been. I just need to give them a shout out. I don't know if any of you use them, but they're, they've been ones to help with two of those families. And wow, to have them in our community, to be able to help and work, and number one, keep that confidentiality, but also just being able to um, work with us has been um, phenomenal. So that's, I can say without giving away too much, but wow. 
Uh, we are working on the Title I reallocation grant, and what that is is if there's any leftover funds from last year's Title I that schools in the state of Maine didn't use, they put that into a pot. If you remember last year, we were able to hold summer school at Elm Street and PCS using that Title I reallocation. We had about $65,000 in order to hold that, and so Elm Street and PCS are working together with me to be able to fill out that application for the end of the month. Um, our math leadership team, that's our K-6 math leadership team, we are working on our program review of Everyday Math 4. Uh, we are planning is for next May to make a decision if we're going to stick with the program or, or have an option for to leave that and replace that with something else. Uh, we're looking at data that includes student achievement data um, right up from um, that we have from grades 2 all the way up to grades 10 and that's our K-6 teachers are looking at that as well as some perception data from our, our staff who teach the program. Uh, we're also working on our vision of mathematical teaching for the future. And then we are also, uh, some of you out there know that we have a math fact fluency. So those are the you know, basic, you know, when you say eight times four equals 32, or six plus six is 12, uh, we do recognize that's one of our areas of struggle. And so we are working on that um, uh, in our team, as well as including in the seventh grade um, team uh, to be able to help increase our mathematical fluency. So we uh, look forward to being able to publish that plan uh, early in the fall to be able to work on that next year. And then, whew, that's a lot, and there was a vacation week in there, uh, is the strategic planning team. We're working on our mission statement. Uh, we've worked on core values. Uh, we have done a SWOT, which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We've, uh, that team has reviewed academic, financial data, and uh, perception responses from the survey. Uh, Todd has been in a couple of the schools to do that same SWOT protocol with our teachers so we can have some statements to be able to include in our strategic plan. We're working on the focus areas uh, that will become those major chunks of the strategic plan. And our A team is going to be the ones that are lifting the vision uh, part, the vision work of where do we want to go. So we really do have the right people sitting at the table to think about that future, that future part. So uh, it's a collaboration all together, as well as as uh, taking into consideration the NIAS that Eric has talked about, that accreditation at the high school. One of the, the one of the parts too of the strategic plan will be a portrait or a vision of a graduate. So what is the portrait of a of a PRHS graduate? So that will be part of our strategic plan but that won't happen until the fall, so with his timeline. So it's a many hands make light work when it comes to that. Do you want to say thank you for having the strategic plan be with a group of community members, staff members, town officials, uh, and, and you folks, because I really do feel that there's power behind bringing people together to have those discussions and make those, those uh, that strategic plan all together. It's a lot. Woo. <laughs> Good stuff is happening in RSU 16. Good job. Questions or comments, Amy? I'm just going to keep it rolling tonight. <laughs> um, I actually, could you elaborate a little more, Amy, on the the homelessness grant? Is that like new for us? And what exactly yeah, can we do? The, and can we get it again? And, it's new from the state, so they allocated some money in order for us to be able to prevent homelessness. So we do have students that you see in Jenny's report every month that are designated designated McKinney Vento. Okay. And we have funds set aside through Title I to support those families. These are this is to prevent that homelessness. And yeah. so ours our grant is basically focused on uh, electricity, water, fuel and rent and okay. so there is uh there is a form that this school counselor or social worker that we designed together designed with them yeah um, that does meet the grant requirements and so they do meet with the families and uh and then once that form is then gotten to me then we work to be able to um pay their bill so we don't okay. we don't give the money directly to the family so yeah. like, that's why we work so closely like the fieldings and yeah. so you know we talk about when you're delivering that oil and then they send us the invoice, Fieldings does, and we pay them directly. Okay. Just the same thing with like rental assistance. If we were yeah. doing that, then it would be a bill would come from the person that. Like directly to the landlord. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is good. Yeah. And so this is new funds. And so we made sure to apply for those. And uh, actually, I just heard uh, at the end of last week that there was some school districts didn't accept them. So there was some more reality. Yeah. So yeah. they're like, hey, you got some more. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> And so it's it's the counselors in the school and like admin in the schools that identify at risk and yeah. then they just they do the form and go through. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, so it's uh, we have about fifteen thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Everybody that's tells. Great. And, yeah. So identifying need. Um, this is a way to keep people from falling through the rips in our social safety net, and we're confident that um, the state is helping us figure out who's in trouble and who's okay. Well, I think the state is, is really focusing on us and recognizing the relationships that our, our teachers, administrators, and school counselors have with families. And because I feel as though those, those are very strong relationships and then being able to have those vulnerable conversations with the family for them to be able to come forward to say that I need some help right now. Yeah, and awesome. Being able to provide that. And it is a limited amount. Um, we are. We are uh, mm -hmm. can only do seven hundred and fifty dollars per student. Mm -hmm. So but every every bit helps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to say it's a pilot. So they're trying to show that this is a need that so we don't yeah. know. You had asked if it keeps if we can get it again. Yeah. It will depend, I think, on what the data shows. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That'd be Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, moving on to our new business, and um, the the first is to approve uh, a, per, a lease purchase or bond financing for the HVAC project, uh, as recommended by the Personnel and Finance Committee at their meeting. So move. It's an or question, Mike. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which one? I, I would like to move that we. Uh, make a recommendation that we um, go with a master lease purchase for the financial um, for financing the HVAC projects in all three elementary schools. Second. Okay, a motion and second. Is there any discussion? What does that look like going forward? Because I know a lot of us have like brought up in subcommittee meetings and stuff like if we are going to put it to the vote and like tell them like what does our relationship with the community look like going forward if we do this do you want to compare that? Three or three. i mean i don't know what the perception will be i think that's what you're asking based on the the uh, results of last year's bond vote is that what you're kind of just in general i guess because like i didn't even know we were going to be voting on this until i saw it on the agenda because i know in the subcommittee meetings we were asking for more information but i actually believe it was april's meeting that got thrown out about us voting on it because there was talk about getting more information about USDA and a couple other things. So like this to me even feels like kind of a surprise, but it was also because we weren't sure if like we, you know, we just, there was talk about doing a referendum anyways. And so that just hasn't come up again. So I just, I'm throwing that out there to see like, what are we doing? We're just, we're doing it and this is it. And how's that going to look going forward with our community? Didn't, didn't Stacey say we if we're gonna go that, we gotta be. If you're yeah. gonna go bond, yeah. she needed to know that. Yeah, the bond, not the lease. Yeah. I think it's the master lease is going to be a much easier sell because we're saving money and we get to make money at the same time. And that was the complaint about the bond issue that failed is that it's going to cost too much in interest and now we're saving interest and we're making money on it. no i support the master so, lease yeah. of the bond 100 percent. yeah i do i just want the, the other community thing that allows it allows us to do it in phases which is the other thing that we've talked about rather than having to do it all at once it yeah. allows us to do it in phases without nothing is being penalized for it yeah in terms of high interest and we're using the we're using the phases word very carefully because we voted to do all three schools, but mm -hmm. in talking to EMC at our subcommittee meeting last month, we learned that we can't, it's unlikely we will be able to do all three schools at the exact same time using local contractors, the companies that are going to bid on the work, they're not going to be able to rip apart and rebuild all of our systems like in one summer. Mm -hmm. So when we say phased and Randy talked to the, about this a little bit, because on our subcommittee, we went into this to great detail. Ideally, it will be the first summer would be all of mine at half of Elm Street, and then the next summer would be the other half of Elm Street and PCS. That's what we've been talking about for the phasing, just because of ordering the parts and getting right. the contractors. But yeah. Angela, I think I, like I understand what you're saying, and I do remember talking about maybe sending it to referendum anyway. Mm -hmm. I think the way that it's perceived by the community is that 
even if we didn't go to referendum, like we we heard what you said, like you were concerned about the interest mm. and like the long length of time, you know, and just how much extra it was going to cost. This like we're addressing their concerns yeah. here, and we're trying to be as financially responsible as possible. I feel like these are like this is what they wanted us. I, I, maybe I'm mm -hmm. like people that I talked to, like they wanted us to explore other options, and mm -hmm. and I just feel I do. I'm worried about like continuing to kick the can down the road. Yeah. Like I it almost and like honestly, we're not going to be able to do it this summer if we. It's the end of you know it's going to be the end of March and then it'll be April. Like if we waited again, like. We might not be able to book contractors for the summer. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, we I see what you're saying, summer. but I feel like tonight is a good time. Like, mm -hmm. especially having heard from Stacy tonight. Yeah. It, I don't. It doesn't feel like we're so locked into something. You know, yeah. like it gives some flexibility. And I think a lot of it is how do we tell a story? How do mm -hmm. we communicate that information to the to the taxpayers? So this is why the decision was made, and we script a narrative that. Then I can go out as I share, post it all over the website, we put it out with all the publications, just saying that this is the reason the decision was made, mm -hmm. uh, keeping in mind the best interest of the leaders. I feel like they spoke very loud and clear that they wanted to keep all three of their right, schools. That's what yeah. I was going to say. And yeah. this is a financially responsible way for us to take care of and invest in all of their schools mm -hmm. without biting off more than we can chew all at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll mention peer pressure earlier, really, but the vast majority of districts that move forward with projects like this, this is the way they go. Mm -hmm. A very, it's a fewer number that, and I'm looking at John City's not because that's the discussion we had. Very few of them are just going to bond. And on the operations subcommittee also, we discussed that this summer, 2024, not happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're, we need to rebid the mine at school work, get current pricing, Elm Street and PCS need drawings, like the complicated system drawings done, and then those projects need to be bid also. So the numbers will be then firmed up after that. So this is just a step in the process to start happening, you know, things to start happening, but the good quality contractors to do the work that we need for big building systems are not now available for June, whenever school gets out the second week of June. So it, we missed this summer, just to be clear. Okay. It's mm -hmm. 25 that we're talking about. So going forward, what we're going to do is, because I'm big on transparency, I know we all do because of what's happened in the past. So we're going to vote to accept, because of the motion, go with the master lease, and then that's going to give Stacy uh, direction to get our three bids. Then we're going to come back again, because then we have to make a motion on whether we accept. Whichever one. Which are the three yeah. okay. And I will we do of course we do communication and I have a tweet. Yeah. Uh, to keep people up to date on yeah. the on the budget <coughs> and the I will sit down with Stacey and try to capture all the points that she articulated so well tonight. Yeah. Capture that in a written document and get that out by which we try to do it every week. Yeah. Um, so that will certainly be something that we will communicate this week. So then shouldn't we be including a number in this motion? Because doesn't that have to go to Stacy, you know, that whole not to exceed 10.2 is that our number or is she just going to go to them and that was the number that we had said is yeah. how we wanted it worded yeah i would say that would cover you mm -hmm. uh, it'll give her at least the guys that she needs to, to make to get the bids. request she needs to make it. yeah okay and it sounds like it will come in under that but mm -hmm. who knows yeah. what do you want to it. change your motion to include that number yeah i can uh, make it Amendment to my motion uh, to not exceed 10.2 million. And Andrea, is that something? You I will still to... second that. Mm -hmm. so that is our, our motion and our second. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? No. That would be <laughs> Moving on, we approve our minus generator bid. That was the packet. I'm making a motion to approve the bid for minus generator. I have a motion to approve the minus generator, which was $88,662 with North Light Electric. Eighty-eight thousand. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Andrea. Yeah, that's a second. Also, second from Andrea. 
Well, does that include the tanks? We already have our own few tanks. Uh, there will be additional tanks specifically. But that the including them? It's super nice. Any other questions, comments? This is three small generators for the minus flow, right? Not one big one. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit, John? Just so everybody knows. Plan? Yeah. So we're kind of under a deadline because we're using ESSER funds for the purchase of the generator. Amy, we got June. Is June our deadline? So we, we had allocated, you had allocated 150000 to put in a master generator for uh, a part of the HVAC renovations. Um, that 150000 would have covered that generator. The problem is, is the projects now are going to happen after June, and we're still losing power at Minot. And when we lose power, of course, we have to close school. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the ESSER funds, um, and without having to do a lot of electrical renovation at the school, we can put in three smaller units that will operate the whole school so that we can attend school. And um, at the time when the project goes through, we'll still go forward with the master generator, and then we will either repurpose the, the three generators or sell them outright. Done. Are any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? One opposed? Anybody abstaining? One abstention. Thank you. Um, right, subcommittee meeting location. So we had our last subcommittee at Minot, and we had some discussion about um, possibly moving those subcommittees. Um, and the only drawback to that is we just have to be a little more aware about where we're going. So. Um, Todd does, does have a recommendation for where we would have those, but first do we want to have some discussion about whether we would like to move those subcommittee meetings from building to building. It was just the three elementary schools because okay. we have our board meetings here at the Municipal High School, so um, we have been and I have heard this was something that was a past practice, but I believe as mm -hmm. with a lot of things, COVID kind of brought mm -hmm. that to a close. I did it in my previous district. I just think it's good to get into those buildings and see them. Um, so that was just a question. Yes, so people have do uh, all the long travel and maybe time. Does that too? Yeah, and in terms of, of this meeting, the reason we're here and, and not in the auditorium is they were setting up for a play um, for us to be, they would have had to move all of that for us to be there. So we will try when we, when it's possible to have our, our meetings there, but that wasn't possible tonight. Mm -hmm. So is there um, any discussion about it? If if not, what's your recommendation in terms of location? My recommendation would be March 25th at Elm Street, which would be our normal location, what we've been doing. April uh, 22nd at uh, PCS, May 20th at MCS, and then June 24th back at ESS. I only did to the end of this year. If this works, it's going to be a little trial for us, and if you can see it go well, I can set up a schedule for the entire year. It would be four. It would be at every site four times. Is there? As soon as somebody tells me where to go, I'm fine. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, that'd be, I'll be lost. Just <laughs> write letters at the top of this the agenda. Okay. <laughs> Is there anybody that objects to that? If not, that's what we will proceed. Okay. Do we have to vote on it? We can like to if you want to make that motion i'll make a motion we vote on it <laughs> <laughs> would you like to make a motion I, i'd like to make a motion to keep the meetings where they are oh no <laughs> oh yes okay so <laughs> steve's motion is that we keep the meetings where they are which is at elm street come on get a second for that Price, no, because there was no if you guys really want to move you go back about five, six years and find that every school board meeting is supposed to be rotated from school to school to school. And we stopped doing it, but we still have a policy on it somewhere. No, I haven't seen that. And it's been a while. So we we somebody passed like, it. Somebody like to make a motion that I'll we make a motion move we our rotate out so some committee sense. meetings at all three grand districts. Okay. We have a second for that and a second from Andrea. So. 
Thanks, we have a motion. Steve, we love you, buddy. <laughs> All those in favor? Anyone opposed? No one's a hope. Looking at our policies and within our packet, we have a policy, uh, the EDB agenda, which is a new policy, and we only made one change from the recommended one from MSMA, and that was to add the word business when we were describing um, the request for agenda item to be received a minimum of seven business days prior to the meeting. And that's to align when we, Joe and I, and I get together and Amy to work on that agenda. Any motion? Do we have a motion to a move to approve? Second. We have a motion to second. Any questions or comments? Just um, I would like to have us entertain adding a sentence in the dissemination of supporting materials section to have a requirement that those materials are provided ahead of time to the board. It's very hard to come into a meeting having read the entire packet and then have a stack of people work on the desk and no time to read it because the meeting is beginning, particularly the financial report that we had um, a, a couple, I think at our last meeting where some of the pages were missing, but that you can't read that type of technical information quickly in a meeting with everything happening. So I think we should have some sort of parameter in there for that. Um, and my, I would, I wouldn't have a problem adding that. Mine would only be if possible. I think there are some times when it is just not <coughs> So how do we, we have a, a motion to accept, but we have some changes to that, so. It does seem like there's a sentence in there that says that. I think maybe it's more just like, I mean, it's that first sentence under dissemination of supporting materials as an accompaniment to the agenda. I guess it doesn't say a week in advance or anything, but it does say that they'll be provided. I think just but the, maybe it's just more of like an under well, in the meeting packet materials when those are mailed out. I mean, we get those on like Thursday or Friday, yeah. you know, just just in advance of the meeting rather than on the table at the meeting is what I meant. Yeah, I don't care the number of days. Yeah. And who, who made the motion? I did. Okay. Would you be fine with amending that to what Jess yeah. has added? You find with that, Joe? Yeah, well, it's it actually, we should probably kill the motion because the motion is to approve and sign. We won't sign to make sure to update it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to take it back to the policy? Sure, or? yeah. Can yeah, I take it back? To change our language. Yeah. Okay, so we can take the, we can take the original motion, just not That's support really it. Right. So the, the motion was to approve and there was a second. So all those in favor? Whoops, wait a minute. Yeah, so if you vote in favor, it won't go back to the policy. policy. Have that language change. If you want that language changed, you would not vote in favor. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't want to vote. Oh. Okay. So all those in favor? Opposed? So we'll take it back to the policy. And our yes. because I'm, I'm struck by we're still living in this world when we know that we're a digital world, and I think digital could aid in the dissemination. So if we have things that show up here, Lauren had to do a ton of work just to print those out for us. If we get an attachment, even early on the day, the day before, for most of us, 99% of us, that would facilitate what you're raising, Jess. So I'm just saying this now because when we come together as a subcommittee meeting, that's probably the recommendation I will make to the subcommittee meeting, but I want to kind of get a question in the wind of the group here because we sh I also think that we should be moving more digitally, which is a whole other thing for us to discuss as a group. Uh, my first thought is that can our um email server handle a document that size that we're talking about sharing around. I know I've had limitations using Gmail to do larger things. So I was 
as long yeah. as I can handle it. It's a good question. I think mostly we're looking at PDFs, which are relatively small. PDFs. Uh, Adobe PDF is the attachment. Yeah, but, but I mean, how many pages is a is this you know hypothetical PDF going to be? Like the ones I was initially thinking. Uh, well, what I'm hearing is information that's added after the fact. You were talking yeah, about. but he's taking it a step further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At some point. Yep. That's a great question. What's the size of the file that we'd be sharing? Oh, well, I was here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that would be a discussion to come back to policy. Great. Mm -hmm. All right, our student representatives. Um, so, uh, I'll give you a little update from last month. The seniors won our winter carnival, so that's exciting. Um, the our hockey team has made uh, has made history because they went to a second round in the playoffs and they almost went to the state's game, and it was a really close game. They had there was a lot of sickness on the team, but they. They really played well, so we should be proud of them. Um, senior celebration is really getting close. We are, we're getting ready for practice presentations at the beginning of April, so that's exciting and a little bit nerve-wracking, but you got to do it. So um, we're, the school's going through reaccreditation, and so we're trying to do things to make our school just like look nicer. So we're putting our getting our bulletin boards ready. We're um, communications committee that I'm a part of. We're doing uh, what are you lucky for for St. Patrick's Day to do something that is going to look nice around the school. Um, AP tests are approaching quickly and for my for my AP class there's 18 more classes until the day so that's it's coming quick and um, my class is doing a fundraiser for Easter and what we're doing is we are paying people will pay us to um, put Easter eggs in their yard and so they don't have to set it up and we, we put the candy and the eggs and the eggs and everything and there's different amounts you can get and we set it up all across the all across their lawns at nighttime for the Easter Bunny. so that's exciting. I think your prices are too cheap on that by the way. You could have totally charged more than what you're trying really? to Really? Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to note the fact that we have such a strong community in the school, especially back when the Lewiston shooting happened. We had a big poster that was sent over um, and on or on the field, especially um, it brings back up with um, Mr. LeBlanc um, and how we had a huge poster and guidance that people signed and cards available. Mm -hmm. um, I know that over the few years that I've been um, captain of the uh, cheer team, him and I have worked kind of closely together and built a really mutual respect bond. So he will definitely be missed um, seeing him at games. Mm -hmm. um, there's new course registrations, lots of new English classes, which is really exciting. I ran out of electives to take this semester, so I was kind of like stuck doing some sort of boring things, but really excited. We have new science classes and they can definitely help look better to colleges, especially um, if you're looking into more specific things. Um, my policy committee is working on the reconfiguration of title names and title responsibilities within four classes. Um, and then I just wanted to bring back up to the board the I know we had talked about this a couple months ago, but um, the education and use of um, AI in schools and you know how can teachers and students both be educated on it because I've been doing this research project and there's been so many big words that I've come across that I've definitely turned to this specific um, one called Claude AI. Um, I set up an account for myself and I was just like, hey, what is this? And it kind of just breaks it down into steps. Um, so just kind of bringing back up that that could be something that is could be very strongly used um, for especially higher level classes, but just in classroom for teachers to have assistance with students. But again, there should also be education on that. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Any questions, comments? I can, I'll just add the turnout by all the regional high school staff or district staff and students, but Mr. LeBron, yes. it, was, it was so impressive with that from mm -hmm. students and staff. Yeah. Yeah, feel that, honey. Don't be afraid to feel that. Oh, no, no. I, him and I were yeah. very close. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, update on just our superintendent evaluation committee. We've had a hard time finding a time to meet, so I think we finally got it nailed down. <laughs> We're going to be meeting um, next week, um, and then we will be providing an update on kind of the process and the tools that we're using uh, at our next subcommittee meeting. So, hearing more about that then, I want to remind our uh, 
people and they can't cross in Poland if you're running again to pick up your papers. And I also want to acknowledge Angela and Mike, who were just re-elected. So, I mean, that's hard to lose when news. nobody runs against you. <laughs> <laughs> it's still it's a win. It's good news, though. Yeah. It's good news. <laughs> and uh, Andrea and I attended a, a Zoom regional meeting um, the other night with other school board members from our Western District, but also from the, the Southern District uh, that included people from New York and, and Kittery. There was lots of discussion about budget challenges. Mm -hmm. We are certainly not the only district that are facing those kinds of, of challenges. Um, there was also a, a pretty detailed update on legislative issues, some of which, um, well, one of them we talked about tonight, the child development services, but, um, and the one that Patrick brought up in terms of looking at the salaries for ed techs and support people that will have a budget impact um, in other years. Um, and then Amy uh, had a group that gathered for some um, Drummond and Woodson training on conducting, called conducting the, the people's business. And there were a couple notes from that that um, she just kind of reminded us of. And the one she reminded us we're doing a pretty good job at, that at our remote meetings, that we need to have that roll call vote, even if there's only one member that's remote. Um, we have been following that practice. Mm -hmm. And another good reminder to board members that we need to continue only to use our uh, school email for school business. Um, and also affirm that the message that we have at the bottom of ours that says, please do not respond to email information. It's not for discussion purposes uh, and could be viewed as a violation of public meeting statutes that, that we should continue that, but that's um, something that's certainly encouraged. So thank you, Amy, for sharing those notes. Um, and that's my report. So moving on to A team reports. Was there anything anybody wanted to comment on in terms of those? I think with the vote tonight, we should uh, let the Minot admins know that uh, a generator is in the works. So they can finally cross that off their list, their wish list. Yeah. And also, uh, I wanted to say thank you to Eric Anderson for sharing the, the spirit recognition profiles. That was really nice to read about those individual students. Um, and Thank Jenny for the increase in the interest and in enrollment in adult uh, enrichment classes. Um, that's a great way to get our community into our schools. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Anything else anyone has? Okay, so we have a motion to adjourn. So moved. A second. A second for Mike. So all those in favor.